Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and welcome to The Post 39, revisioning the future of higher education. Now, I know at the moment that teachers, educators, researchers are being attacked on all sides, undermined and ridiculed. And this movement, this momentum, is part of a wider critique and attack of experts and expertise. It's so much easier to summon a vibe rather than read something or to offer an opinion rather than interpret with complexity the ideas of others. But it remains important to read widely and read beyond our comfort zone and actively ensure that we are seeking out and reading authors and ideas that are beyond what is comfortable for us, beyond what we agree with or accept. And this type of reading stops echo chambers, stops us from being reinforced by people just like us, and therefore it widens out the parameters of our thinking. Now, this week in our Inspiring People, Inspiring Ideas series, I wanted to talk about a book and two writers with whom I disagree, and disagree radically, but I would also argue that it's a productive disagreement. Now, I've configured the post this week to create a thinking space for you. So I've used 10 binary oppositions to offer and create a space in the middle for you to work out what you really think about these important ideas of our time. And look, we're reaching the end of what is a tough year, the end of what has been a tough decade, and yes, the end of what already is shaping up to be a pretty tough century. So it's timely for all of us to take stock. What is important? What are our rights? What are our responsibilities? What matters to us? So today I'm going to talk about a book that's just been published by Rutledge in 2023. And this book is written by Martin Betts and Michael Rossman. And it's titled The New Learning Economy, Thriving Beyond Higher Education. Now, I'm so excited by this book. I pre-ordered this book. Before it was published, I pre-ordered it. And I downloaded it on the day that it was published. And I was disappointed. In fact, I was absolutely horrified. But it is a productive horror, I would argue. So what we're going to do today is create a thinking space about education, what matters to you, what matters to me, and together how we can create a better future. And let's think about the choices that we make personally and professionally about our future. Now, I've made the <laughs> revisioning of higher education my life's work. If there's one trope or idea that has propelled me through my entire professional career, it is that we revision and we evaluate what matters in higher education. Why do we do what we do? So I've argued that we need to stand for something. We need to stand for honesty and authenticity and integrity and rigor. Yes, personal transformation but also enabling and transforming our citizenship through information literacy. And also, if you will, through culture, encouraging curiosity and kindness. Now, this book that I'm talking about this week does not provide that vista, but the debates and the commentaries that are offered provide a great warning for us. Uh, because what's going to happen if we all continue to sleepwalk through these debates about public funding and education, public funding and universities? We've all sort of let stuff happen. And if we just sleepwalk through these policy debates from this point on, we are going to lose higher education. Okay. So what is the future of our universities? What future for our universities is meaningful for you, for your friends, for your family, for your colleagues? For your fellow citizens and to answer that question I'm going to work through those binary pairs and you know they tend to simplify debates and the reason I've done the binary pairs is because I think all of us as Homi Baba has taught us occupy the middle that third space creates the productive engine room and energy for ideas so I'm trying to help you and help myself think about how we structure and think through 
the future of international higher education. And each of these binary pairs ask us all to make decisions about teaching, about learning, about research, about citizenship. But let's start with this book and the authors of this book noting that it was published by Rutledge. So Martin Betts and Michael Rosman. Martin Betts is the Emeritus Professor of Griffith University. He describes himself on his website as, quote, a thought leader consultant, end of quote, and his career has spanned from lecturer to deputy vice chancellor. He holds two qualifications, a Bachelor of Science in Quantitative Surveying from the University of Reading, and he received a 2A Honours for that degree. And I just want to note, obviously, that's a, that's a British degree. And of course, that's a three-year degree. Honours is part of the three-year degree in the United Kingdom. For our colleagues around the world in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, an honours degree is four years. It's competitive to get into that fourth year of a degree, and the dissertation is much larger than exists in British and British-based educational models. So it is a very different system and structure. So he graduated from that Bachelor of Science in 1982. He also holds a PhD. He graduated from that PhD in 1987. And on the CV that's loaded onto his website, this PhD was described as, quote, from the Council for the National Academic Awards, end of quote, in the UK. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'd never seen a degree awarded from the CNAA. And therefore, I emailed Martin Betts and asked him about the university from which he achieved his PhD. And the reply to this email was as follows, quote, At the time my PhD was awarded, the CNAA was both an accrediting and awarding institution. I commenced my PhD registration at what was South Bank Polytechnic, now London South Bank University. My CNAA degree was conferred at a ceremony at Leeds Polytechnic, now Leeds Metropolitan University. I didn't attend the ceremony. I have been listing it as a CNAA degree for 35 years. End of quote. So this degree, awarded in 1987, was his last degree that he achieved or was awarded from a university. So from these qualifications, he was able to attain a DVC role. Importantly, he was the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Engagement. So he listed his key professional life achievement as, quote, merging the faculties of built environment and engineering, science and IT at QUT, end of quote, and he described this merger as saving seven million dollars and, quote, repositioning STEM at QUT, end of quote. And for my international colleagues, QUT is Queensland University of Technology. Okay, the other author of the book is Professor Michael Rosman. Now, he gained his German equivalent of an MBA from the University of Munster in Germany in 1992. He completed his PhD in Information Systems from the University of Munster in 1995. And again, he has completed no further university qualifications. And I'm stressing this because this is going to become very important very shortly. Uh, he is the director of the Queensland University Centre for Future Enterprise in Brisbane in Australia and Professor of Information Systems at the Business School at QUT. And he describes himself on his website as, quote, passionate about designing more effective and efficient universities. End of quote. Now, I've spent a lot of time introducing those two researchers, and I'll make sure that their websites are in my reference list at the end so you can check my work. Because it is really important to note that there are no teaching qualifications of any kind held by these gentlemen. And also, you notice there's no leadership qualifications, there's no leadership studies at all in any of their qualifications. But from this book that they've written, you're about to hear a great deal about learning and teaching, and you're about to hear a great deal about leadership. But there are important arguments for you to consider about this book. But I also need to log for you that many of these arguments are 20 years 
old. They are discussing how online learning will revolutionise our universities. Now, this is not new. A large number of people have received a large amount of money over the last two decades trying to talk about the revolution of online learning. Now, of course, I'm so old that I have been teaching online courses since 1998. Yeah. And remember, some of you may not know my research career, but I'm the person who published the books Digital Hemlock. <laughs> in 2002, the University of Google in 2008, and Digital Dieting in 2013. So the problem is that many of the platforms of online learning in the last 20 years have been absolute failures because there was no attention to student motivation, student diversity, or understanding how learning actually happens. People without any teaching and learning qualifications telling us how teaching and learning happens, man. Now, online platforms are great, they're useful, and they're important for learning. Digitization can enact all sorts of literacies. But platform choice is only one of three variables. So when we configure a learning event, we have to think about the platform of delivery, absolutely, but we also have to think about what is the knowledge? What is the disciplinary literacy? What is the knowledge we're talking about here? And of course the third variable is who are the students? Who are the students that we're teaching? So as you can see, we've got a large number of pretty well-paid consultants who have been for 20 years selling one variable in learning. In fact, the easiest. They've been selling platform, selling hardware, selling software without any attention to knowledge or the sociology of the student cohort. And they're then surprised when the online learning revolution fails year after year, subject after subject, course after course. And obviously the pandemic again was the great moment in online learning. And once more, student motivation to engage with the online learning materials was lacking. And the online learning revolution, once more, was a failure. But Betts and Rossman predict a revolution that has, of course, already happened. They describe the future demographic of students being beyond the 18 to 24 age group. Now, that reality has not only happened, but that reality was part of my classroom at Murdoch University in 1997. Okay, so right now I have, I think, five PhD students over the age of 65. I have eight PhD students over the age of 35. Now, this is not new. <laughs> this is not surprising. This is our lived reality of higher education right now, that we've got so many students far beyond 18 to 24. And so, therefore, it's very, very easy to log an innovation that actually happened 20 years ago. Still, I wanted you to see how expertise in higher education, what education consultancy looks like and the standard of it at the moment. So as we think through these binary pairs, I want you to ponder what you believe is the best future for our universities. Think about what expertise looks like for you. And your first decision is about the nature of teaching and learning. And our first binary opposition is teacher and content provider. Oh my goodness. So Betts and Rossman discuss teaching and learning actually very little through the book. Instead, they're very focused on how content is delivered to consumers. But teaching, particularly high quality teaching, requires years of training, credentialing, reading and research about how to teach. At its most basic, teachers at a university level have to assess the level of the teaching they are doing, the context of the wider degree, explore the learning outcomes for that subject, for that year group of the degree, and of the degree overall. And then we all backwardly map from those outcomes. Now, these outcomes, sadly and awkwardly, are often described as generic competencies. There are a lot more than that. They are knowledge in and of a discipline. Now, occasionally this is termed disciplinary literacies, hello Norell, but also disciplinary knowledge. Teachers do not deliver 
content. Teachers build knowledge on the basis of research and they ensure that generation after generation of students hold expertise, not content. We build the relationship between form and content, education and knowledge. So whenever you hear a university teacher or a teacher at any level of our system described as a content provider, you need to critique and question it at every opportunity because this label completely misunderstands how teaching and learning takes place. Like teachers are supposedly like delivering content like you deliver a pizza. Yeah, nah. So our next binary opposition is the really interesting one. University learning and professional development. Really interesting. Now, Benson Rossman made the argument, as we know, that students are no longer the young people. You know, the young people in their late teens, early 20s. And that's true. And it's been true for 20 years. However, they then argued that human beings will continue to learn through our career. So we won't finish a degree and never return to higher education. And again, they're right. But <laughs> that concept is called the, quote, learner-earner learner earner and it comes from the remarkable scholar Terry Flew, my respects to Professor Flew, and he developed the learner earner concept in 2002. So therefore as you can see we're walking about with a 20 year old concept. It's an accurate concept but it's 20 years old. All of us will and have return to formal learning through our careers. We'll do a degree, do some time in the workforce, return back to be a learner earner. And also can I say what's completely undercooked in this book is the huge number of part-time enrolments that we now have. So our wonderful students who never actually leave the workplace and they simply enroll in a degree or a diploma or a certificate on a part-time basis. So Betts and Rossman argue that universities are in a great position to offer professional development and they're right. And again, universities can and have been for 10 years expanding into micro-credentials, nano-credentials, globally available, competitively priced. Now, all of this is true, but Betts and Rossman then jump from that argument that's been in existence for decades now to arguing that, quote, corporate academies, end of quote, should be providing the professional development. These Corporate academies, content providers, really, 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 are highly under-regulated and frequently involve an underqualified entrepreneur, so hashtag some random, realising that there's money to be made out of professional development. Now, public universities can do this professional development work, and we can do it really, really well, but what it requires is bundling and packaging of high quality knowledge in different ways and we're doing that already but also and I'd really like to acknowledge the great idea made by Martin Betts and Michael Rossman and the weird thing is they sort of did this as a throwaway and actually this was the, the greatest argument they offered in the book but they argued for the the gift of a new provision a new service made available to alumni so at the moment, sort of alumni, all of us are sort of contacted by the university whenever they want money. So it's about philanthropy, right? So they write to you because they want money. But there are different ways we can organise the relationship with alumni. For example, an annual fee for access to new nano courses, nano experiences, lecturers from lectures from the great lecturers in our university. So if you will, a subscription model for alumni. And that means that our research can be shared with our graduating students and the relationship between academics and our former students can be sustained. And of course, learning can continue through a subscription service. Brilliant. Brilliant. But the trouble is when private providers take over professional development, this is a really, really under-regulated space. And the quality of the learning and the quality of the delivery are going to be very variable, which leads to my next binary pair for your consideration. Community and individual. Now, Betts and Rossman 
in their configuration of the new university are obsessed about individual choices. So individuals should choose what they learn, when they learn and how they learn. They want our university's future to resemble Netflix using long tail economics. Universities become a content provider and a platform for a streaming service. So individuals choose what they learn and this might seem really great, this might seem ideal for some people, but going to a university is not like going to a shop. What's the point of this? What are we doing actually? Now why do you think through history, and I'm talking from ancient Greece, Socrates on really, why do you think through history people have made a decision to learn in groups? Now, Betts and Rossman are against the lecture, and they're against the lecture because they don't understand the lecture. The problem or the issue in our universities has never been the lecture. It's been poor lecturers. Lect lectures are amazing. They're multi-sensory, they're synchronous, they're analogue, they are community experiences and yet Betts and Rossman label them as quote passive, end of quote. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. They clearly have not seen great lectures and they clearly have either not seen or have forgotten the maths lecture. There is a reason why our remarkable mathematics colleagues around the world have dug in and they've stayed with their blackboard and their chalk. And I love them for this, by the way, because teaching maths, wow, is incredible to watch. It's multi-sensory. Students see, they actually see how derivatives emerge. And maths lectures are frantic. They're intense. They're highly concentrated and engaged learning experiences. Now, lectures can be the most motivational of learning experiences, but sadly, about 20 years ago when online learning was introduced, what happened was the trope of flexibility became more important in learning than motivation. So online lectures started to proliferate of low quality because no one taught the academics how to speak to a screen, how to edit work, and online lectures, of course, have very little to do with the sweaty, intense, multi-sensory experience of a lecture. It was assumed that students would gain from the flexibility. But what happened was, lectures were available on demand, and because students did not have the intrinsic motivation, inspiration, intrinsic passion to learn, that of course is created through lectures, only one third of online lectures are viewed by students. So they're not even getting the content. So as you can see, the cost of flexibility was student learning. Another cost was the building of a community of learners. There is no doubt that professional development, by the way, and I'm talking post-degree professional development, can be delivered in this customised, individualised way, delivered on demand. There's no argument there, because post-degree students have shown themselves to be successful learners. They've learned how to learn. They are extrinsically motivated. So. They, we, all of us, need a skill, we need to get a competency to improve our work, to improve our professional life, and we go out and we find that. But remember, when we're dealing with an undergraduate student, they do not know how to learn. They don't know what learning is, and they don't know how to maintain intrinsic motivation, learn that discipline. Now, the 10 most memorable moments in my entire learning career, and I am close to death, every single one of those moments I remember where my brain changed, where learning and life transformed, every one of those 10 moments happened in a lecture. And I remember everything about my first lecture at the University of Western Australia delivered by the remarkable Professor Richard Bosworth. 10 a.m. it was on the Tuesday, my first lecture at university. A brilliant man, inspiring, passionate, 
powerful, funny as hell, and also is pretty frightening too, which was great. Now at UWA, all these brilliant students arrived in this first year history lecture, and he said, nothing you've ever learned in history in the past is going to prepare you for what you're going to learn here, end of quote. Frightening. But it was brilliant and he developed that community of learners. The learning was intense, tutorials were intense, but they were difficult and we were being tested. Now, I met a group of people, many of whom I still know to this day. I met one of my best friends in life. Hello, Guinevere. I met one of my best friends in life because I accidentally, it's quite emotional, that I accidentally sat, sat next to her in Richard Bosworth's lecture. Life's amazing. So does this mean that online learning communities cannot be formed? Absolutely not. I've spent a lot of the last 20 years, and of course my last couple of jobs, were very focused and doing really tough work, because it's very difficult, to build online learning communities where students around the world build, build up those bonds, help each other, maintain motivation. Right? Very difficult to do, takes a lot of time, a lot of skill, but it can be done. But individual learning may work for professional development. So skills-based, extrinsic, it's about speed and it's about efficiency. Now Udacity can do it, FutureLearn can do it, LinkedIn Learning can do it. And I've actually worked with all those providers this year. I've done 34 micro-credentials with those online learning providers. Did I learn something? Absolutely. Was I inspired, excited and fascinated? No. No. But I have enough experience in learning to manage mediocre delivery, to manage pretty dated knowledge, and because I'm motivated, I get something out of most learning experiences, right? But we must not celebrate this mediocrity as the future of higher education. <laughs> These are not Rolls-Royce educational services. The Rolls-Royce educational services exist through synchronous group learning in our universities. Now Udacity, Future Learn, LinkedIn Learning are, if you will, the Mitsubishi Pajero of learning providers. A bit ugly, ugly. Not really sure what it is. It gets you around, but not much more. But real learning, deep learning, transformational learning requires time, struggle, confusion, fear, and the building of community. Learning is difficult, learning is sweaty, learning is uncomfortable, and communities of friendship, learning buddies, create lifelong connections. So Benson Rossman celebrate personalized learning, tailoring the student needs to the instructional environment. They describe students taking control of their learning and their personal learning pathways through these flexible learning environments. But the trouble is, let's be honest, first year students and pathway students, so precious to us, so precious to the culture, they do not know how to learn. They haven't learned how to learn. They do not know how to take ownership of their learning or make choices or understand the consequences of those choices. Now, when I was a head of school in an Australian university, we did a study of attendance in lectures and student results. Hang on to yourself. And we found a causal, yes, I said causal relationship between attendance in lectures and the final result in that course. And let me tell you what the, what the study showed. In a 12-week semester, if a student attended eight or fewer lectures, eight or fewer of the 12, they failed, full stop. Each additional week that they attended, so they came to nine lectures, 10, 11, or, or 12, their grades lifted and rapidly, the graph looked like that. Right? Particularly, this is yes about knowing more, but it's about participating in a learning community because you're learning about standards, you're learning about motivation, and you're also learning about responsibility. So instead, Betts and Rossman discuss, hang on to yourself, quote, 
onboarding learners in a personalised learning environment. End of quote. Onboarding learners. And of course, then they discuss the importance of learning style preferences. Now, that's a model of learning that's been critiqued for 20 years, and I'm going to come back there. But let's do our next binary opposition, student and consumer. The public funding for education and health obviously remains the big issue, the big topic around the world at the moment. So what is not discussed, of course, is how public money was used to bail out the private banks a decade ago. Gillian Tett in our session last week talked about that brilliantly. So public money bailed out private banks during the global financial crisis and billions of dollars went there. So public money happily used to buy out bail out private corporations that were supposedly too big to fail, but that singular decision is revealing an impact that we're all living with, particularly those of us that work in health and education, to this very day. The depleted healthcare system could not manage the pandemic. And our incredible, must not get emotional, our incredible healthcare professionals suffered and they're still suffering enormously because of the infrastructural, personal and professional neglect of public health. Then we get to education. The appalling statistics of early childhood, primary and secondary teachers who are leaving the profession after five years. So they're trained, they're in a classroom and the work is so incredibly difficult, it's costing them their life and their health and the life and health of their families. And then we hit, of course, higher education, our universities. We're always an easy target because you know, we're the clever people that need to get a real job and get out of the ivory tower because we're not connecting with the real world. Now, this is, of course, ideological rubbish. And it sort of works until we start to look at every most important invention or intervention in the last 100 years and we see that these inventions have all emerged from a person who has been to a university or was taught by somebody who had been to a university. So we start to look at the great writers, the great musicians, the great filmmakers trained in our university and even I know a lot of you are enormous fans of Brené Brown, I'm a big fan of Brené Brown, but people forget she is a professor of social work at the University of Houston. She is an academic first. So universities are intellectual, cultural, social, scientific, political powerhouses. They're where bright people come together, discuss really complicated ideas with other bright people and improve knowledge. And then they impart that improved knowledge to the next generation of scholars. So the cycle continues. University academics do the bulk of their public service work for free. I know outside of universities, people are probably not aware of this, but the bulk of the writing and the refereeing and the speaking and the consultancy work that we do is given for free. It's the people who receive those services don't pay us. So we're not in the ivory tower. We spend our days caring for the next generation of humans and developing the next step, the next moment in knowledge. So the idea that at this point where public funding is supposedly a problem, that we now have to remake students into consumers, this stuff is bonkers. Now can I say, I'm not being nostalgic here, I'm the first generation in Australia of that generation that had to pay fees for our degrees, okay, so my first degree I had to pay fees, I've had to pay fees all the way through, and for example my last master's degree that I graduated from, in fact I graduated from in April this year, I think, so 2022, my last master's degree cost me just under $20,000, so I think it was $19,500, and nobody paid for that except me. I paid for that out of my household expense, our household expense. So the problem is that students are now paying absolutely crazy fees. And if they're paying fees, are they consumers? If they're paying fees, should they all pass? Now, Betts and Rossman believe we now have plenty of educational content that's now free and freely available. And they didn't question that all this freely available content 
came by the way of academics who are paid by the public purse and giving this information to citizens for free to engage with in their daily life. No, Betts and Rossman now want this freely available educational content packaged up for sale. So learners become customers and they pay a subscription fee for their educational upgrades. Wow. So the problem with this model is that they're not terribly interested in research at all. They're not interested in academics teaching the research that they're doing. They also don't realise that all of this, this is the bit that makes me laugh, all of this free content sort of magically available on YouTube has emerged from the goodwill of publicly paid academics in permanent posts. And they, we, are doing that to enact public discussion and dissemination. But as the full-time academic staff are being restructured out of organisations and the precariat, the casualised workforce takes over, and remember that casualised workforce, they are paid to complete discrete tasks in a lecture, a tutorial, doing marking, discrete tasks in a semester. All that free, high quality content that Betts and Rossman are celebrating, that they're now going to supposedly commercialise and corporatise, is going to stop. So if universities are corporatised and students become consumers, then the notion of public good, the notion of quality, rigorous education where students are tested, assessed and they may fail. All of that disappears. So Betts and Rossman continue to confuse content with learning. So is YouTube a model for universities? Well the first thing is YouTube is great. It houses for free videos. It's a great dissemination tool but it's not an environment for teaching and learning. Content provision is easy. Learning is hard. And remember the title of this book, The New Learning Economy. Well, there's lots of attention on the economy, not the political economy, can I say, but there's lots of attention on the economy. There's little attention to the new bit, because the ideas they're talking about are 20 years out of date, and there's certainly no learning there. So let's do our next binary opposition. Here we go. Multimodality and online learning. Now, Betts and Rossman endlessly celebrate online learning. Indeed, it's their solution, their medication for every problem that exists on the planet now. When in doubt, let's, let's have online learning. Now, I've heard these arguments and the celebration of online learning for 24 years. And through those 24 years, there's been no desire to pay the big money that's required to create the infrastructure for this high quality online learning environment. Interface management is incredibly difficult. Professional development for academic staff costs some coin, and of course the purchase of high quality equipment to enable the production of this content is also very expensive. And can I say all <laughs> all the equipment that I have, and I probably in this house alone in temporary accommodation, I probably have about $30,000 worth of equipment, sound and vision, and can I say every single one of those bits of hardware and software I have bought out of my private money, all right? But of course, we're not talking about content. I'm not. I want to talk about knowledge. And of course, I'm not talking about digitization. I'm talking about multimodality. And there are many signs that Betts and Rossman are jumping onto this very populated bandwagon that's been trundling along with reduced efficiency in the last 24 years. But there are two signs here that these authors have very little expertise in andragogy. And let me just tell you what these are. The first one is that unbelievably they talk about quote unquote digital natives. Now this phrase came from Mark Prensky in the early mid 2000s and there would be ooh, about 200, 250,000 references on Google and Google Scholar that critique this argument. And let me give you the argument and I would like to apologise for the appalling neo-colonial language that's about to be used. So Prensky argued that there's a group called Digital Natives that are born into digitization. So basically, they emerge out of the vagina doing a TikTok dance, okay? 
And then there's another group called Digital Immigrants, and they're still learning how to set the clock on their microwave. This taxonomy was wrong, it was inelegant, it was offensive in the mid-2000s. Now it's just ridiculous. And remember, the, the date of the book that we're talking about here is 2023, and they're still talking about digital natives. They also didn't realise the very paradox of their argument. So if their student population is far beyond the young people, that's the new university, then what's the use of configuring the infrastructure for digital natives? Hashtag oops. Then the second giveaway that they don't know what they're talking about is they mention and hold on to yourself, quote, learning styles. Learning styles were critiqued and critiqued hard at the very turn of the 21st century. There's no evidence that students have intrinsically, like they're born with, particular preferences or are hardwired hard for particular styles of learning. This is nonsense. And the reason that it was shown to be nonsense is that literacy theories were proliferating from the remarkable New London group. And they started to publish this research soon in the year 2000. Some early work came in 1998. But if you look for these remarkable books, and they are books, multi-literacies is one of them, of course, situated literacies, disciplinary literacies, and of course, multimodality. Gunther Kress, you rock. So if a student has a preference for watching a video on double speed while reading the captions, that's not a learning style. That shows a singular development of visual literacies and reading basic text. So they've not developed, they've not developed sonic literacies, the capacity to listen and learn and reflect. Now, literacy theory changed my life, obviously, but at its most basic, all five of our senses provide us with information and literacy is the capacity to take that information from our senses and render it meaningful. So if generations of students have not been present in lectures, so what lectures do is you have to make meaning very quickly from sonically delivered information. That's what a lecture gives you. So it means we've now got generations that haven't developed that sonic literacy. But think about the gift of all those environments that are multimodal. The best of educators can use touch and taste and smell all the senses to render the learning evocative and powerful. Learning styles, that phrase, flatters students and it flatters citizens. And it flatters, flattens the people who haven't worked hard enough to develop a diversity of literacies. And to be honest, the moment I ever hear learning styles or digital natives, I switch off because I know the person hasn't read SOTL, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, hasn't read SOS, the Scholarship of Supervision, and has not read the astonishing 20 years of literature from literacy theory. Next binary opposition, here we go. Higher education and further education. Higher education and further education, about 30 years ago, used to describe very different sectors and very different qualifications. Both are incredibly valuable, can I say, and both are different. So I know the language I'm about to use here can appear quite dated. But higher education was about knowledge development. Further education was about skill development. The differences between these sectors were also configured via the teachers who operated in those sectors. So in higher education, a teacher in higher education has a PhD and is research active. And that means they produce the research in the field in which they are teaching. Now in further education, those remarkable teachers often held perhaps a master's degree, but importantly they had occupation-based experience and they were sharing their experiences with students and remember they tend to not be research active, but they had high level of skill development. So what's now happened, particularly in the last 20 years, is these sectors have started to merge and it's a two-way merging. Universities have created teaching only staff, staff who are not research active 
and teach students and further education is now offering all sorts of pathways into higher education and we saw this particularly in Canada big love to all my wonderful wonderful people in Canada I adore you but we saw it in Canada particularly Ontario Ontario and BC in the early to mid 2000s where the FE HE partnerships and pathways started to intensify and many un new universities were formed that were further education colleges now, I believe that this blurring and this merging is a huge mistake because both sectors are important, but both are different. And look, I'm speaking to you. I'll go through the experience here. I've got, what have I got? Three bachelor degrees, two graduate diplomas, four master's degrees and a PhD, right? So I know something about higher education. But can I say, I also hold a series of FE certificates. My death doula certificate, for example, was from a US-based further education college. And I'm enrolled and nearly finished four different certifications from FE colleges in the States. So valuable learning. I love it skill development certificates. But the moment we have academics teaching students and those academics are not research active, we need to think about what we're doing in universities. Now for Betts and Rossman, this lack of academic credibility and credentialing was actually a virtue. And we'll return to that issue in our last binary pair. But let's do our next one, quality and competence quality and competence. Now, the word that is absent from this book is quality. And the phrase that is absent is quality assurance. If the focus is on skill development and further education, then competency and competency-based training can be fine. So when you're learning to use a spreadsheet, you've got to be competent at it. When you're learning to drive, you've got to be competent at it, right? But higher education doesn't require competence, it requires quality. External regulators must assess universities and our courses at regular interview, intervals, and we're being assessed for quality. In the UK, and can I say, I'm a complete supporter of this system, and I loved it when I worked in the UK, it was a privilege to be a part of these systems, but in the UK, every semester, external examiners come onto the campus and they look around the campus and they assess the curriculum and they talk with academics that taught the course, they look at curriculum, they talk with students and yes, they read assessment that students produced and the mark given to it. And then they come to the assessment board or panel and the marks are not validated and released until the external examiners are called. And that's what makes a university a university. Quality and quality assurance. Not taking someone's word for it that we know what we're doing, right? But being experts and having that expertise checked over and over again. Now, Benson Rossman decenter what they describe as, and hold on to yourself, quote, regulatory trust, because they argue that regulatory trust is the model for the, quote, established learning economy, end of quote. And what they want is, quote, new learning economies which are rich in opportunities for providers with ambition. It is high in threat for those reluctant to act, end of quote. Actually, that's all well in, to be honest. It's the inverse. If you act without regulation, that's when you're going to get in a deep trouble. But you see, all the focus is on scalability and innovation rather than quality assurance and regulation. Okay, well, what's going to happen if your focus is on scalability and innovation? Let's work through that logic tree, okay? So do you want your health providers, your health professionals, your lawyers, your engineers to have passed through a regulated degree program? Do you want your physicists? Do you want your chemists who work in mining or renewable energy or in medical labs? Do you want them to have been taught by outstanding physicists and chemists whose work is checked at every level of a degree? I would. But instead, Betts and Rossman ask, quote, what can we learn from Tesla? <laughs> End of quote. Tesla 
is their model for higher education because, quote, Tesla understands how to attract attention in a hyper-competitive industry, end of quote. Attracting attention is not the point of higher education. Valuing and validating quality is the point of higher education. Let's do our next binary, teaching and research. Here we go. One of the saddest parts of the Betts and Rossman book was the systematic disrespect of university research and university researchers and the systematic disrespect of the great university researchers teaching the next generation because of course teaching was reduced to content provision. Research and researchers are not relevant to content provision. They state, quote, a significant question for all new learning economy participants is whether present forms of scholarly research and the expectation that all teaching staff will pursue it remain a capability given executive attention and resources. End of quote. Fascinated by the phrase executive attention and resources. But let me address the question the other way. What makes higher education different from further education is that most of us in universities have a PhD. Before we even get a job, we have a PhD. And we must be research active. Now, conservatively, research activity is defined as producing five referee publications in a five-year period. Now, that seems very, very low to me. I demand of myself five publications a year, every year, noting most of mine are singly authored too. You know, in that variable is also included like those articles with 20 authors or 30 authors or 50 authors, right? But that's the basic level, five in five years. But what this means for teaching is that my knowledge, research active researchers, our knowledge is tested. It is going through refereeing and peer reviews of a commentary on our work continually. It means I have to go out into the world and create something new in the field of research that I am teaching and I am assessed, I am evaluated year after year after year. And by the way, my first uh, research publication appeared in 1993 and I've had publications, a lot of them, every year since 1993. And I care about this and it means a lot to me because I want my students to look at me and I want them to assess me and assess if I am worthy to be their teacher. I don't talk about knowledge, I make knowledge that I also talk about. And the moment we start to separate out the teaching and the research functions in our universities is really the moment that higher education drips into further education. Put another way, do our students deserve to be taught by the experts in a field? Okay, and then how is that expertise verified if it's not through qualifications and ongoing research? So if students are now customers and consumers paying for the service of education, then surely they've got the right to know the quality of the people providing them with that service and ensuring that that's accountable and open and transparent. Next one, knowledge and content. Here we go. Now in the year 2007, I wrote an article titled The Google Effect. And I showed the impact of Google searching on information literacy and the impact of Google searching on teaching and learning and citizenship. And that was further developed in my book, The University of Google. And I argued at the time that Google flattens knowledge, flattens knowledge, and that anybody can put in a very simple search term in the search box and they can get an answer to their question returned at about the level that they can manage. So invariably, 90 plus percent of Googlers look at the first page of Google returns and don't go beyond that. So searching has replaced researching and the simplicity of the answer click there's my answer, has replaced the capacity to see multiple ideas and make an interpretation or determination. But further, I argued that Google flattens knowledge. So a go-to 
video, and I love me a good GOAT video, can I say, but a GOAT video becomes equivalent before a search engine to a refereed scholarly monograph. So this means all sources are flattened, and that's what digitization, disintermediation, and deterritorialization does. So over a decade, well over a decade now after this work, we can see that digitization has now been monetized through advertising and revenue. And all the focus is on holding attention. Think the TikTok video. So I really would like us to think through the impact of the attention economy on our learning economy. And that's why we're hear, hearing so often, I think these days, the phrase content generators, right? Influencers generate content. And that content invariably is how to put on magnetic eyelashes, which I haven't really managed yet, getting contour powder right, minimizing wrinkles, right? That's influencers, yeah. Now, dear me, now the tragedy is we live in a time of influencers and not scholars. And it's no surprise really that the attention economy is now framing the learning economy. And to summon a bit of Baudrillard, the Simulacrum University is now a collection of TED Talks. So they're collecting up some TED Talks, and then those TED Talks are monetized on YouTube. <laughs> That's our new university. Now, Betts and Rossman focus on disruption, urgency, acceleration, individualization, and they stress what they describe as, quote, pop-up learning experiences, end of quote. Pop-up learning experiences, like a pop-up shop, right? Okay, now I'll just use one example to show that this is complete rubbish. There are thousands I could use. So, how are students going to learn about vacuum science? In a lab, on a piece of equipment that's worth millions of dollars or pounds or euros. How are they going to learn about the elegance of vacuum science in a pop-up learning experience? If you want to learn about how to create that fantastically strong eyebrow line with a template, then influencers and content generation via Google will give you that answer. But if you want learning in depth and with guts and with passion and profile and scope and scale, it's going to require a bit more of you than the first page of Google returns. Which leads to our final binary opposition, yay! Corporate leadership and leading for good. Betts and Rossman are very, very interested in leadership. And there is a reason they're both very interested in leadership, because both run consultancies, and consultancy businesses, and trust me, the big money, the big consultancy coin comes from delivering leadership keynotes and training. And by the way, if you notice the irony of this, they're saying that the lecture is over, the lecture's not important, the lecture's boring, the lecture's passive, but of course, they, through their consultancy, deliver all these lectures for which they are paid. Good luck with that. So it's no surprise that they're terribly interested in university leadership, noting that they don't hold university degrees in leadership. They suggest, Hang on to yourself. That being an academic should not be a foundational imperative of a vice-chancellor. That actually vice-chancellors can and should come from other industries. So currently, the vice-chancellors of Sydney University and Charles Sturt University, quite an odd combination, that one, they do not have PhDs and they're not research active and they've had no actual research career and no actual teaching career. This is the equivalent of bringing in a managing director for a large mining firm when that leader had previously run a, a public relations consultancy for a grocery business. So no specialist expertise in open cut mining, engineering, health and safety, regional and remote employment. No, none of that expertise. You know, they've got a bit of transferable skill. They can move it from one industry to the other. We know that's rubbish. We know that's rubbish. So, for example, Betts and Rossman describe Mark Scott, the Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sydney, as follows. Quote, Scott 
has never worked in a university, had little research standing, and was unfamiliar with university standings, end of quote. This is supposedly the pathway to the future. As Betts and Rosman state, this future leadership, quote, will have expertise in business innovation and more of a critical perspective than expertise in the academic endeavours of research and teaching and learning. End of quote. Is there anything more dangerous than a critical perspective on a topic or area or idea about which we know very little. We've seen the consequences of a critical perspective offered by people that don't know what they're doing during the pandemic. That didn't go very well. But let's probe this argument. A university leader does not hold research excellence, teaching excellence, an academic track record of any kind, so where precisely are they gaining their expertise to develop this new learning capacity? Where's that coming from? And let's follow through the logic trees. Think about all the remarkable vice chancellors around the world, accomplished, credentialed researchers, outstanding teachers, and have gained great expertise in leadership. So. They're great human beings. They've got everything. They understand research, they understand teaching, and they understand leadership. That's what a vice chancellor is. And of course, if you haven't got one of those three, then, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? And we must not, we must not accept unqualified or underqualified people leading our universities. They must be outstanding human beings, outstanding researchers, outstanding inspirational teachers, outstanding and inspirational leaders. And a vibe and experience and storytelling is not enough. I think our public deserve evidence, qualifications, credentials that verify that this human being knows about teaching and learning, they know about research, they know about leadership and management, not only in terms of experience, but expertise. And instead, Betts and Rossman want ambitious leaders who are storytellers, who are able to radically change and corporatise higher education, creating scale, competence, not excellence, and raise new revenue through the massification of content. So they want leaders to introduce what they describe as the, quote, elegant and intuitive interface of Netflix, end of quote, and believe, and there are an entire chapter in the book on this, can I say, that higher education leaders must now make universities more like Tesla, Apple, Spotify, and Netflix. This book was published as Elon Musk took over Twitter, and he was selling disruption chaos and mass layoffs and within a week Twitter was no longer in the top 10 of online sites to be visited and what no one was, was expecting I think was the disgust that came from users, disgust. But higher education, our universities are really special, special places. They're still populated by great people good people, decent people, who want to go out into the world and make it better. Yes, help people make money, get people into work, get people financially stable. That's part of the deal. But making money is not the only imperative. If you think about what life is about, yes, you make the money, but we make meaning. And what life is about is about making meaning. Quality is our foundational trope. Motivation is our foundational trope. Meaning is our foundational trope. Obviously our public universities must be efficient, frugal, careful, respectful of public money. I've run very, very large budgets at our university and every dollar 
that's public money. Every dollar is precious. We must care for and respect every single dollar. And therefore our universities must remain anchored by expertise, qualifications, deep reading, complex assessment, quality assurance, and maybe, just maybe, a focus on quality and care and respect and compassion will lead us to the future of higher education. Now I know I've been tough in this vlog today and that toughness has come from fear and worry and concern that this may be the moment finally where we lose our beautiful, glorious, powerful universities and we're losing them because consultants like this are validating words like disruption, acceleration and change without understanding the destructive legacy that these words contain. So we have a choice colleagues, we have a choice. Are we going to stand by and allow our universities to crumble? Or will we stand and intervene to ensure that knowledge and expertise remains empowered and valuable? I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.